Hello, welcome back to Low Code Dev Tools with AppSmith. In our last episode, we introduced AppSmith and its potential for rapid application development. I'm Viral, your friendly neighborhood coder. In today's episode, we're diving deeper into AppSmith. We'll start by creating an application and then adding a table widget to list items we fetch from Pocket Base. <music> First things first, assuming that you have AppSmith up and running, I showed you how to do that in the last video. So just check out episode one, where I go through the installation process and exactly what you need to do to get AppSmith up. Now, let's assume that you have a screen that looks something like this. Um, if you don't, just click on the AppSmith link in the top left, and it should bring you to this home screen. I mentioned in a previous video, this is workspaces. It should create one for you by default. If you don't have one, just hit create workspace and you'll get a workspace. So that's how easy it is. Let's delete this workspace I just created here. If you have an app that it created within the workspace, don't worry about it. We're not going to be using the app. We can delete it if you want. Um, don't need to have that there. So we have nothing. Um, if you want, you can rename your workspace. You just go over here, click on the edit button here and change the name for your workspace. Workspace is just a collection of applications. That's all it is. So don't spend too much time on it. What we want to do is create a new app. So let's click on this create new button. So we don't have an application to import. We don't want to work with templates right now. So just click on application. When you do that, you'll have a new application. It's going to be called Untitled Application 1. Of course, you can change the name very easily. Click in this drop down, click in Rename App, giving it a new name. There's another way you can change app. Once you have your inside of an app, you have this left um, panel set of buttons. You have Editor, you have Data, you have this Libraries, which we're not going to talk about right now, and then you have Settings. In settings, you see here, um, once you click on general, settings general, you can change your app here, and you can change the app icon. The app icon is what you see here. You can see this one was like handshake. Well, that's where it's from. So if you click edit again, you go back into the application and click settings, you can change this from this handshake to something else, like maybe this store. I don't know if that's a store, but it looks somewhat like a store. So you can do that. You can click on share and embed in to see what that's about. We're not going to change anything there, but you can take a look. The theme for your app, like the color theme, is going to be blue. You can change it if you like. I would suggest just leaving certain things right now. And so since you're not quite familiar, if this is your first time, of course, once we finish creating the app, feel free to go back in and just play around. You can't mess up anything really it's you just have this you'll have the step on how to recreate the application if you want to and then you can change things like the borders and all that sort of stuff and this is navigation we'll come back to this when it makes sense to look at it but again you can play around once we have multiple forms and so on um, import that's if you want to import an application again we don't have one to import so that's it when we have multiple pages in our application um, again, we'll talk about navigation when we do that, but right now we only have one page and let's don't worry about data or any of that stuff. Let's just jump back to editor. And in the editor, you can see we have three tabs. We have queries, JavaScript, and UI. For today, we're gonna focus on just this UI tab. And the first thing I want you to do is just drag this text box widget and put it on the screen. If you don't see it takes back widget for whatever reason. Let me just delete this. Um, let's say on UI, it looks like this. Well, just click new widget and then you'll see the list and then you can search, you can type text. And if I do contact, now inside of inputs, you'll see rich text editor and input. We don't want a rich text editor, nor do we want an input text box. We just need a te text to display some text in some other UI. Um, libraries, this might be called label. So it's just a display in text. Notice how it says hello, Veral Adams. And as it do with when we sign in and we configure um, Pocket Base, you can see it knows the user and the email. And so you can see there's this 
um, expression here. Pocket Base uses handlebar, um, or some people call it mustache um, expression. Um, so it's like two curly braces, some expression, and close curly braces. And you can see it says app submit that username or app submit user that email. So if there's no username, then the email. We can get rid of all of this and change this to items because that's what we want this page to display this is page one of course we can rename this page also so we can go here click on this drop down go over here on these double dots and this and call it item or list or something like that and we can of course name to this component instead of just being text one we can give a name to this component but i don't care to give it a name which i can do over here because we're not going to be referencing it in code names Okay, so this is items. That's the first component that we've um, UI element we've dropped on our form. Let's click new and then drop a table. I'm going to make it a bit long. I know it's all we're not gonna display too many fields, so I'm not gonna really mess with the width. Notice how we're being asked to connect some data to our table. Now over on this side, if you look at um, the name that's given to our table element or component or widget is just called table one. So I'll call it items table. And that's what I mean by giving them these components better name depending on how they're going to be used. And so if we're going to be accessing that. So I want you to give it a better name. Here is a table data. And so if you over over, it says it takes an array of object to display rows in the table. Now you can bind to something else using expression enclosed in mustache, but we're not going to do that. So here, we, if we have a drop down, you see we can then connect to some data sources, but we didn't cover data sources. So we're going to just click on JavaScript, and now this changes this block to say, oh, we should accept JavaScript. So what are we going to put in here? So let's jump back to our command line. Now remember I said that how we're going to be using these low code tools to develop front ends for our back end. Our back end is pocket base. So please get pocket base up and running. I have started mine. And if I go here, you can see we have items. So you don't need pocket base to use app Smith nor app Smith depends on pocket base. Actually, app Smith has its own way to manage data. But since for us, um, we already uh, went through using pocket base as a nice backend and we're going to store their data there. Then now we want to see how can we create UIs or front ends very easily. So we're going to use the two together. So what you will want to do is make sure that your items API rule is set for access by everyone. You do not want it to be admin or any other rules that we had there before for the authenticated user or anything because right now I don't want to deal with authentication. So make sure it's our listing rules and view rules is set for um, everyone. If you want to leave, create and update and delete for authenticated user, please go ahead, do that. Right now we're just going to read data. The next thing that we want to do is let's go back here and I'm going to go to my directory where I'm doing pocket base. So one of the ways we can get data from pocket base is by running curl command against our pocket base um, items collection. And that's what it looked like. So of course, we can make it look a lot nicer by piping the result to jQuery and have jQuery format the output. Uh, or even better, we can run HTTPIE, which allows us to type less, and it's already nicely formatted. Now, we can certainly do this and you know even redirect the result of this into items.json. And if we do ls, we'll see as how we have Docker compose file that we have from before, or stack where we store our stacks. We have this directory called episode two. I'm going to put items.json in episode two directory actually. And then I'm going to start up my VS Codium in um, this directory. So we have items.json. Let me just save it to format it. And so that's nicely formatted. So all I did was command S to reform, save the file, even though it's already saved, but that trigger formatting of the file on save. 
and then I have my that env file. Now, I can certainly use the command line, like you see, I just did, and got the data. Or um, I can use Insomnia, some graphical REST client like Insomnia or Postman, but I'm going to use REST client within VS Code Editor. I already show how to use that and plug and set it up. And when we're doing um, pocket based, I'm not going to go through that again. But here I have a file called HTTP uh, items.http. And you can see using the .env file is going to access the collection URL slash item slash record. And if I just click send request, it sends it. Now we've already saved this output already, so there's no point in doing that. But the only reason I'm going through this is to sort of show you um, what we can do with REST client. And there's some other things that I'm going to show later. And you can kind of guess because you can see the rest of the um, queries there. However, for now, here's our items result. So let's copy this. So I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this file here and just copy this. Um, the other thing I could do is just copy this directly from um, the terminal. So if I did this, I could scroll up here and just like do this. And my terminal is configured to copy on select. So simply by selecting that, I have it copied. All right, so let's add back now to, to Hapsmith. And here it says, well, it, if you remember from before when we highlighted it, it says it requires an array. So we just copied an array. So if we just paste this within here, notice how immediately our table is updated with fields, um, you know, column headings and the data. That is very easy, and that's one reason why this is an awesome piece of tool. Look how easy it is for us to get a table that has the ability to search, download, and pagination, and we didn't write a line of code. We just drop a table widget on the page and then paste some data. All right, so there are a number of columns here that we don't, you probably don't want to display. So if we head back over to our table, so let's just collapse this a little bit. You can do things like style the table, um, but we're not going to do any of that right now. We can focus on the content. We're not going to do pagination or any of that sort of thing. But for the data itself, if we scroll down, we'll see their columns. And so right now, it automatically picked up 10 columns from our data. We, of course, don't want to show collection ID, so we can hide that. We don't want to show the collection name, so we can hide that. We don't want to show created date for each element so let's hide that description i don't think we should have the description in our table listing so let's hide that too what about the id well hmm, probably shouldn't have id either so let's hide that um, images well we can revisit image so i'll leave that the labels will leave that and table name and price updated date we definitely don't want that um, we should probably reorder this. So let's put name for so we can drag and drop that um, after ID. And there you go. Um, we now have name, images, label, and then the price. And of course, we can expand this. And so there we go. Now, when it comes to the price or even the column names, I don't really like these names. So let's change the name. So capital. And for name and then we'll do capital I images and then labels of course we'll put capital L for labels and the price capital pre for price capital P for price um, for the price we want to configure this so let's click this gear wheel for this column and notice how the type is set to number so if we do a drop down we have currency and see so we can select currency and US dollar, and that's fine. And if you look at how the, this column's um, value is being computed or calculated, you can see this is current row for the stable, and then it's pulling out for the current row. Since it's a JSON record, it's pulling out the price field. And that is always being stored. Very easy. All right, so we're not going to change anything else. Of course, there are many other things you can do and style it, but this is good enough. We click the back arrow, and that's it. 
we have finished creating our table showing data from our pocket base. Now we didn't tie this in directly to pocket base because I want to cover one thing at a time. Now why fetch more data than we need? This is waste of resource and network bandwidth and of course client resource to fetch thing that you're not going to display like all these columns that we have here that we didn't display. So let's go back to our Visual Studio Code editor and let's see what we can do about it. So if we just selected the fields we wanted, which is the ID, name, price, and images. Now, the reason why we want ID is because later on, when we select an item, we're going to want to find more information on it. So we definitely want ID. So we can do that by just using the fields um, query parameter to say which fields we actually want to return. And so that reduces the amount of data we're going to be sending back. And we can even go further. We can say that oh, for the labels field, we want to expand it. And once we say expand the labels field, now we have to also say we want to send back that expanded field. Because remember, when you expand the field, you um, also get a new field called expand. Now, when I send this, I did not get um, you know, the expand field like I expect. And that is because um, like I mentioned before, you want to make sure that uh, for your items and labels that your API rule is open. And so since I'm not logged in, this says admin only. I'm not logged in as admin. So I'm going to unlock this so that um, everyone can access it. Again, we're just testing this out right now. I don't have this access. Um, I don't have this exposed on the internet, so I won't have anything to worry about. And so once I go back now and I say, let's send this request again. Notice how for labels, there's this expand field and within it is expand label. And then there's a collection for the labels and then the label name. So the only thing I really care about are the label names. So I'm going to say I want to filter out everything else except the expand that label name. So I'm literally just navigating down to this field. So expand labels that name. And of course, I still want expand to expand the labels. And so now when I run this, you can see that we have ID, name, price, images, and expand label that name. Now you may be wondering, can we not expand images? Remember, images is not a collection. It is just a field to represent a file. So we can use this to fetch the file we want to display, but this we cannot expand it. All right, so, so let's go back now and that we have this, let's copy this. So it's right here, we have what we want. So we don't have to go back to the command line. We can copy it right here. And so say copy. We can go back to our browser to here. And then we highlight everything. I mean, if you want, you can delete it first to be sure that you got everything. And then I paste this new array. And notice how that information is there. Of course, the order is a little bit messed up. And um, of the we have now have this expand field. We don't want expand because that is just extra information that we were trying to display. And so what we can do is change it to labels because that's what really is in there, labels. And we can click here, the gear wheel. And here we can see it always current row, that expand field, which is fine. So what we can do is if we click on that, we can see it all. That's an array containing the labels. So we can say, let's access the labels. And so now we have now an array of those um, label names. Now, we're not going to go much farther than this. Um, it's getting to a little bit of crazy code that I don't want to write here just yet. The other thing we can do is we can then, let's just go back. We can scroll down to our images and we can say, well, if there's an image, why don't we display that image? And again, we can, we have maybe multiple images. So we can say, let's just pick the first image. And so that would be the first element. So we can say like square bracket zero, and that would be the ID of the first image. But we know that oh, this is just the name, that file name for that image. If we actually want to display it, we'll have to now reach out to pocket base. So for that, what do we need to do? 
Well, if we go back to pocket base here and we go to our documentation and we go to file handling, let me zoom in a little bit, and you can see file URL, you can see it's your pocket base installation and file collection or name, record ID, and then the file image. So we have essentially everything we need. We have the record ID and we have the file name. We also know which collection we're dealing with, so items, and we can reach out to this URL. Now, here's the problem. This URL or this IP address is for local hosts. But remember, we're running AppSmith within Docker. So we need the to connect to the pocket base that's running on our computer, not um, and the host itself, not within Docker, because we do not have AppSmith running there. So for that, there's a way in which you can get to the... So let's just copy this so that we can have it. And what I'm going to do is go back to my VS Code editor. And let's just play around with it here to make sure that we can successfully um, fetch that file, and then we'll try and do it from within AppSmith. So let's do call this like, yeah, get item file. And so I'll paste this. And of course, we can put a get if we want to be explicit about, and I like being explicit. So localhost 8080 slash files, and then our collection name is items, of course. Now, what is the record ID? So let's just make a request and get a record ID. So let's use this guy. We'll put it here as our record ID. And then we'll use any image, but in AppSmith, we decided to use the first one. So let's do that. And now if we click send, we get back an image. So this is great. All right. So why don't we see what it would look like for AppSmith? So if we go back to AppSmith, here we have just the file name, but we also need the record ID. Well, that's sort of easy to get. We can do this bit, current row that ID, and that is our record ID, forward slash, so it would look something like that. Now we need the other bits, Com complete the URL. We can't use 127.0.0.1 colon 808090 slash API slash files slash items slash. The reason why this wouldn't work is because 127.0.0.1 represents a local host and we're running AppSmith in a Docker container and that local host does not have our pocket base. So we talked about this earlier. So what we need to do is figure out how do we access the pocket base that we want. Well, there's a bit to it, but basically we want to access port 8090 that's running on our laptop or the guest machine where we have Docker running. And for that, um, you can find it in the Docker um, documentation, but Hapspix made it super easy to say if you want to connect to a local database, and this video explains exactly why um, you need to do this. So it's host that Docker that internal that represents the um, the host on which pocket base is running. And so there's quite a bit more if you're running on Linux and all this other stuff, but we're going to ignore all of this for now. And I'm going to simply try it and see if it works here. So let's go back to AppSmit here. Well, we have the URL, but remember the type here is plain text. We don't want plain text, we want an image. So when we switch it to that, we see it oh, this doesn't quite work. And the reason why it doesn't work, well, a couple. Let's go to our command line and let's go to pocket base. And I'm going to stop pocket base and clear screen and just press up and run it again. And you can see pocket base is listening on local host 8090, which means Nothing can connect to pocket base that's not running specifically on my, in this case, my Mac. So anything that tries to connect externally, like from a yeah, Docker container, that's considered like another host. So it's not going to be able to connect because that port is not open. It doesn't see that port. So what we need to do 
is minus help and this will tell you that if you're using the serve command by default is listening on or it binds to this port and um, host and port but you can say slash HTTP give the string to say I want to use something else so we'll do exactly that 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0. but I'm just gonna say listen to all so basically everything that connects on local port is still gonna work everything that connect on the IP address associated with this machine is going to work and the same still the same port 8090 so when I run it like this again pretty much looks the same except now let's go back and see if it will work from pocket base and so um, if I were to I don't know, change this to plain text again and then change it back to image let's say um, hmm, something um, is not right it still didn't work and to be honest with you um, I expected this to work I don't know why the host that docker that internal is not sort of resolving to my host machine which is my Mac but there's a way we can still get it to work and that is by simply let me just go here to this I can run the command ifconfig and it's if I just run this command just like this it would list all my interfaces and how they're configured on this machine so let me just insert this bit after i recorded this um, for those who don't have a command line don't know how to open a command line there's another way you can find your ip address for your machine if you need to let's say host that docker that internal did not work for you so regardless if you're on windows or mac or linux you should see an icon that looks like this like your wi-fi so you're going to want to click on that and then you're going to want to click on Wi-Fi settings. And then once you click on Wi-Fi settings, you should have something that looks like this. And here you'll see it has Wi-Fi details, for example, for Mac, but in Windows, it's going to be very similar and Linux can be very similar. And you have to click that additional button to get more information. And as you can see here, it's telling me that, oh, my IP address is that 10.100.98. And if I click on TCP, you'll see IP address. It's right there. So this is for um, those folks who don't want to do the whole command line thing. All right, back to the command line. I have a large number of interfaces, so it'll be pretty long. Uh, in my local network, I'm using 10.10 as my local network. So I'm going to pass it to this ribgrep to see what my IP address is. Now, if you don't have ribgrep and you use in grep, for example, you can do that. Now, if you don't have grep, just simply print out the whole long list and look for the one that's on your network. For most people, it's going to be something like 192.168.0 or that one, something like that, right? Um, but anyway, you should know what your IP address is. If Docker that if host that Docker that internal doesn't work for you, just find the IP address. And now, once you use you have the IP address. You can go back to AppSmith and let's use the IP address instead for my Mac. So 10.10.100.98. And notice as soon as I type that in, what happened? It pulled it up. So those are the images. And look how nice and easy that was. I mean, sure, we had to learn a few other things, but overall, not bad. Just imagine if we had to write all this in code. And there you have it. We have created an app, added a table widget, um, featuring data that we got from pocket base and displayed it beautifully in our table. In the next episode, we'll dive into more advanced UI components and interactions. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more local development tips. See you next time. Take care. Bye.